Well, welcome. Welcome those who are joining us online. Uh, it's exciting to have you guys here this morning. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I had the privilege of uh, spending my summers at a, a Christian trailer park. And every week, they would invite a different speaker and a different uh, band or, or group to, to lead the worship that week. And at some point during the week, there would be a time where uh, either maybe it was a speaker, maybe it was the, the worship leader, where they would have a, 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 an altar call of sorts. It was a, a simple gospel invitation where they would kind of share the gospel and then invite anyone who had not yet received Jesus to, to bow their heads and to pray a very simple prayer. And it was a very simple prayer, just basically uh, highlighting the fact that they were forgiven and they were inviting now Jesus into their heart. And after that short prayer, the, the pastor or the, the speaker would ask, anyone who prayed that prayer, raise your hand. And then there'd be silence. And in here, I, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. And as a little boy, as a little kid, I so desperately wanted to look. I wanted to raise my head. I wanted to look around. But I was afraid if I did, I'd hear, I see those eyes. And so I just, I just kept quiet. I just kept my head down. And I showed some self-restraint for, uh, for once. But uh, this is the typical. It wasn't just uh, uh, growing up. I realized that that was happening all over in many different churches. And it really is an exciting moment to hear people in that moment making that choice to, to place their faith in Jesus. Because it's an amazing what's happened in that moment, right? That in that moment, you are now saved. No more hell. That's a good thing. Amen? You're, you're forgiven. You're given a clean slate. That's good. You're part of a new family. You're now <clears throat> in the family of, of God, loved and accepted, and that's good. And, and now Jesus lives in your heart. <clears throat> Although, to be honest, it took me about 20 years to figure out what that even meant. But nonetheless, now you're saved. Now what? What happens next? And, and do we just sort of wait until you know, some heavenly Uber shows up and takes us back to heaven. Is that it? Is that what we're doing now? Or it, what's the point of all this? And, and theologians would say, well, now begins this process of sanctification. Sanctification, that's, a, that's about a $15 word. Used to be $10, but inflation and all has kind of raised the price of it now. So it's a big word. But that's our goal this morning, is to understand what this, this word sanctification means. Now, what is that, how does that apply to our life today? Now, Robin asked me what I'll be preaching on this week, and I, I told him it's sanctification and what it is and what it is and what it looks like. And then I said to him, I hope it doesn't sound too boring. So my hope is that that's not going to be kind of boring for us to talk about this theological concept, because the reality is it matters. It has a huge impact because it's what's going on today. It's what you and I are experiencing each and every day here. And so I'm going to pray that the Spirit makes this, this simple truth alive to us, that it's not some theological concept that is just sort of for knowledge's sake, but really one that gives life to us and gives us hope. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're excited for what you have in store for us this morning as we're, we're going to look into your word. We're going to discover, hopefully, what this sanctification process looks like. And so we're inviting you, Lord Jesus, to be the teacher, to, to breathe new life into a concept that maybe we've been afraid of, maybe we've been felt con condemned and judged by, but that one rather that we would find hope and freedom in, Lord Jesus. So we're excited for what you have in store. In your name we pray, amen. Well, the passage we're going to be reading from today, if you've got your Bibles with you, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're, we're kind of wrapping up the chapter now. This is kind of the third message in this chapter, and it's all kind of following the same train of thought. And we've spent a lot of time understanding about the law and what it is and what it's not and what it's for and what it's not for. And, and he's now coming to a close on this chapter. So beginning in verse 17, Paul writes, now, the Lord is the Spirit. Right, So the Holy Spirit is the Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. All right, this, is, this idea here, being transformed, is, again, that term sanctification. And so let's see if we can understand it a little bit. Now, the, the English word sanctification is from the Greek word hagimos, which is the root word is hagios, which just means to be holy or to be, to be set apart. 
Uh, Hagios actually is the same root word that's used for saint, for those of you who are playing at home, right? And so this, this idea here of, of sanctification, of being holy or set apart. And this week, I was reading many different views on sanctification and, and what it is and what it's not. And, and they all generally pointed to the same point, the same ending, regardless of, of the denominational background, where they're coming from. They all kind of came to this, this idea. And it basically it boiled down, down, down to this. That sanctification is the process of being set aside for service and ministry to God, becoming more like Christ in our conduct and character, where we are overcoming the pollution of our sinfulness in order that we'd become more pleasing to God. That was, a, that was basically what these theologians were coming down to. And I, I believe that's what's being taught in most churches when it comes to sanctification. In fact, if, if you're in a, a church or listening to a pastor who's more motivational, you know what I mean by that? More trying to motivate you to live well, giving you ideas and principles that we're now to apply to, to live in our life and each day and we get excited about that with the hope that God will reward you with blessing as you follow his principles. That's all based in this idea that there's somehow now you're, you're, you're growing up and you are trying to learn new behaviors, overcoming that, that sinfulness. Now, there's some other aspects of this sanctification that is often taught, and, and it is progressive in nature. I used to think this, by the way. I don't anymore, but I used to think that it is progressive in nature. In the sense that it was in our spirit, remember, we're, we're comprised of three components or three aspects, a spirit, soul, and a body. And it said in our spirit that you have been, past tense, justified. In your soul, you are being, present tense, sanctified progressively. And in your body, you will be, future tense, glorified when we get a new body. And so I, I used to hold to that idea. I used to hold to the idea that I'm trying to overcome my sinfulness as well. But I don't believe that anymore. And, and the problem is here is this idea of overcoming that old sinful self, that denying our old sinful nature, the idea that less sinfulness somehow leads to more godliness, that, that more right behavior will lead to God being pleased with us. That's what I grew up with, but I, I, don't, I don't think that's what it is anymore. Now, some would teach that this sanctification, this perfection ultimately is attainable, while others would say it's never going to be attainable. We're never going to get there. But what's interesting is in how it's taught, how, how we do it. And, and the, the messages, again, over and over, ago, uh, over and over again, are things like imitating Jesus. Remember the, the WWJD movement? What would Jesus do? And you're somehow to think like Jesus and act like Jesus. You know, the first person was to float that idea, right? That you could do something to be like God? Started in the garden with Satan. And yet that's what we've been taught often, is that you are somehow going to come up with this idea that you can live like Jesus. Charismatic churches would teach that sanctification is really the, the product of the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of you, which is second from salvation. So it's a second blessing, they would call it, where you would, you would pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon you, evidenced by speaking in tongues, and that would be sanctification. Some would teach that it requires a crisis moment in your life. Uh, and in that crisis moment, you make a deeper commitment or a recommitment, and that would be the sanctification moment. Others, again, emphasize that it's the result of overcoming sin and addictions in your life, where you're, you're cleaning up your behavior, measured by, essentially, by the law. So that as you, as you go through this Christian journey, there's less swearing in your life. There's, you're no more struggling with pornography or no more drunkenness. You, you stop eating at Burger King and Taco Bell. And, and that sort of mentality where you're starting to clean up your life. As well, it's taught that you just need to have the ever-increasing practice of spiritual disciplines in your life. Attending church regularly, reading and studying your Bible, prayer, serving others, uh, fasting, evangelism, tithing, and so forth. Please understand, most of those things aren't bad. Giving up Taco Bell is, by the way. That's just a free one. That's just, that's just for your own colon, I guess. But, that's, but most of those things aren't wrong, per se. But I don't think that's what sanctification is about. See, our, our enemy, he loves to take what's good and use it for our own destruction. Right? We see that over and over again with how he uses the law. That the law is holy, righteous, and good, Paul says. 
but he's using it against us. You see, the flesh understands our weaknesses. It understands how we're wired and, and how we're built. He under, it understands what the struggle that each and every one of us faces in our soul, the battle that we faced our entire life with shame. And shame says there's something wrong with you. There's something not right about you. And so we've spent our entire life trying to, to answer the question, am I OK? And so am I, am I doing enough? Am I enough? Do I have what it takes for this challenge? Am I going to be loved and accepted? Or am I too much? Am I too much of a mess? And so all of these questions are, are flooding our soul from the flesh. And so then we start to wonder, well, maybe, maybe if I can live like so-and-so, maybe if I, could, if I could clean up my act, and maybe if I could do this, and maybe I could stop doing that, maybe if I could be more like the great saints that have come before us, and maybe then I'll be OK. And you see, the flesh is doing that because now it can point to some standard, some expectation, some law that you can, it's trying to get you to live up to. And the flesh is always wanting to put you under the loss. Any thou shalt, not just the Ten Commandments, any thou shalt that it can put you under, where you're measuring your love and acceptance, you're measuring whether you're OK, is being determined by your living up to that standard. But as we've been seeing, what the law does is it's, it's going to be used by the flesh to kill us. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. Or Romans 6 and verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under law but under grace. Do you see, when you and I go back to the law, what masters us? It's sin. It's the flesh. And so anytime you're feeling like a pile of sin on a stick, that's a technical term, by the way, <laughs> when you're feeling condemned, when you're feeling not good enough, Ask Jesus to expose what's the law you're under right now. Because the flesh needs you to be under the law. The flesh needs to control you through the law. But more than just how current teaching on sanctification turns us towards the law, I think there's some other understanding or, or problems with the current understanding of sanctification. And that's why I think commentators and theologians have disagreed on it. They failed to nail down a clear understanding because, quite frankly, it's not that clear in our Father's word, especially compared to some of the other aspects of our salvation. For example, salvation, it's taught that God does it in its past tense, right? Something like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved. Past tense have been saved. By grace it was God's doing. Or forgiveness. Ephesians 1, 7 talks about, in him, we have the forgiveness of sins. Again, God did it. He purchased it on the cross. And it is past tense. You don't have to ask to be forgiven anymore. It's already been accomplished. Even justification, which is the, the, the word that means to be made right, to be made righteous. Past tense, Romans 5, 1, that we having been justified in him. But sanctification is not as clear. It's not as clean. Some verses are past tense. For example, 1 Corinthians 1.30, by God's doing, you're in Christ Jesus, who's become to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Has become. He's already become sanctification to us, past tense. Or 1 Corinthians 6.11, such some of you were, when you, but when you were washed, you were, past tense, sanctified, so sometimes it talks about it in past tense. Other times, though, it makes it seem like it's present tense. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, now may the God in peace himself sanctify you. It's an ongoing idea here, it would seem. And then some verses say that it's God's doing. So the next verse, in verse 24, says, faithful who, he who calls you, for he will bring it to pass. So this idea of sanctifying is done by God, it says. Or Philippians 1, 6, for I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Again, God's doing the work, it would seem. But then there's other verses that would seem to apply it's our job. Philippians 2, 12. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not also in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Or 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. 
Be like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So what is it? Is it past tense? Is it present tense? Is this God's work, or is it my work? All kinds of confusion around this. But I think at the heart of it, the, the biggest problem that we have is that we don't understand the cross. We don't understand what God has done, and that's, that's what's led to all this confusion when it comes to teaching on sanctification. Because we haven't understood what has really transacted on that cross. Specifically, that there was a co-crucifixion, that you and I were crucified with Christ, that we were buried with him. Isn't that good news? Like, what happened to the old Michael? Died with Jesus. Gone forever. The problem is there are times where Michael may act like the old Michael. And so what's the temptation to think? Nothing's really changed. Um, I'm I'm still the same old person that I'm still the old self, I still have a sinful nature. And that's what most of the teaching around sanctification is is holding on to, is this idea that you haven't really changed, that your sinfulness, the sinner that you were born, is still around, and it's now up to you to wrestle him and overcome him. It's now up to you to clean up your act in some way. And so that becomes the pressure. But I love, it wasn't just that you and I were crucified with Christ, but we were buried with him. Isn't that good news? Because what is burial saying? Get gone. Right? You don't don't bury someone that's still alive. And so what God did is he crucified the sinful nature, and he buried that sinful nature, and he said goodbye to it. And he's not about to raise it back from the grave. And yet, that's what a lot of people are believing, is that Somehow, every day, that sinful nature comes back. And every day, I need to put it to death. Do you realize that if every day you have to put the sinful nature to death, that Jesus has to die as well? Because the only way for you to die was in Jesus. And so does Jesus need to die more than once? Do you and I need to die more than once? No. But here's the glorious part of that, is when, you, when Jesus walked out of that tomb, when he was made alive, Ephesians 2, 5, and 6 says, you and I were made alive together with him. But now, as a brand new creation, as a brand new person, there's a new Barry. And that new Barry doesn't like country music. He just doesn't know it yet. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Couldn't. Low-hanging fruit, I know. But he's a new man with a new heart. He's no longer the sinner. He's a righteous Holy, beloved man. That's who he is, with a brand new heart, and his heart is pure. Well, what about Jeremiah 17, 9? It it says the heart is wicked. It's beyond cure. Who can understand it? That's true. That's true of the old heart. That's true of who Greg used to be. But Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27 says that God's given you a new heart that he removed that heart of stone, that that wicked, dead heart. That's what was crucified. That's what was buried. That's what's gone. Now you have a new heart with a brand new spirit, new desires that actually loves God and agrees with God and wants what God wants. That's what we have now. But that understanding of the cross is not well understood in our churches today. And so we believe we're just sinners saved by grace, even though that phrase never shows up in Scripture, not once. We believe that we still have a sinful nature. We believe that we're still trying to overcome ourselves. And now it's up to you to do that. And they fail to understand the significance of the cross. It's more than an allegory. It's more than an illustration. It's actual facts of what happened to us. But if we, again, if we don't understand that, then, then we're just sinners. Positionally righteous, but conditionally sinful. Positionally holy, but really down on her here on earth, no good. And we're in this miserable pit of sin and, and, and defeat until Jesus comes to take us home. And so that's why we turn to the law. And again, what does the law do? Condemns, offers up death, empowers sin. 
and it's miserable. So let's see if we can come up with a better understanding of this concept, this idea of sanctification. Remember what we said, the word literally means to be set apart or holy, specifically in the sense to be set apart for God. So you think about it in the Old Testament, right? We'd have the furniture in the temple, <clears throat> even the, the, the cutlery, the plates, the cups, every little bit in that temple was consecrated, was sanctified, was set apart for temple use, which means it wasn't, it wasn't used anywhere else. It was only used for in the temple. Or you had the Levite nation. They were set apart for God. They didn't have their own land. They didn't have their own farms and flocks. They were set apart for God. And so that's this idea here of sanctification, that God's goal in this sanctification is to set us apart for himself. Yes, that includes service. But much more than that, it's setting our heart aside for him. It's where, where God is taking a greater role and a greater influence in our lives. I still remember when this happened with me, where, again, growing up in the church and and, and being taught you know, the, the stories of scriptures and, and what a good Christian is supposed to do and <clears throat> how he's supposed to act, I, I, I would endeavor to do that. I would endeavor the best I could to live that out. Always struggling, always coming up short, always feeling like sin on a stick. And then God began to teach me and show me the glory of the new covenant. And what began to change was miraculous. It wasn't just some of my behaviors began to change, but my heart began to change. Up to that point, I had a goal. My goal was, was cars, was engineering. That's what I wanted. I wanted to do. I wanted to design cars. I wanted to build cars. And the faster, the better. So if I could get in on race cars, I would have, I would have sold a part of my soul to do that. That was my passion. That was my goal. But then as I began to discover and discern more about who Jesus is to me and who I am to him and the relationship I have with him, you know what changed? My heart's desires. I didn't, I didn't care about cars anymore. I didn't care about racing as much. Not that those things are bad. And, and you can enjoy those things. And I, I still do enjoy those things. There's nothing like a, the sound of a Ferrari. Nothing like the sound of, a, of a, the roar of a Lamborghini or the, the beautiful pitch of a Formula One engine. You want to hear music, listen to a Formula One engine sing. Just beautiful. So I love it. I still enjoy it. But you know what? I could leave it. It doesn't, doesn't have that same draw for me anymore, because I'm more interested now in what my father's doing. I'm more interested in the business of my father and what he's doing. And so this sanctification is going to involve in a change of behaviors. It's going to change your heart's desires and what it's after. It's also going to involve a healing of our past hurts. Because those past hurts are what's preventing us from moving forward. It's keeping us in bondage. And so I think the best way to think about sanctification is not, is not transforming from who you used to be into who you are. That's that progressive nature of it. But I think a better way to understand sanctification is to, to understand it in the sense of maturity. Because see, in maturity, you, you are becoming who you already are. And I believe that Paul had this idea of maturity in mind, talking about sanctification. Here's some more verses. And I got a lot of verses this morning because I really wanted to drive home the significance and the, the point of what Paul's trying to make here. But in Ephesians 4, verse 15, he says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Hear that term, grow up, mature in. Colossians 1, we proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom, so that, here's our goal, we may present every man complete. The NIV used the word mature here in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, brethren, do not be like children in your thinking, yet, be evil in, be, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. I think Paul's using mature as a synonym for sanctification. We could have read every one of those verses with be sanctified, 
but he's using the word and the idea of maturity. Even the, the, the writer of Hebrews, his complaint for them is that they were immature, that they couldn't handle the, the, the meat and, the, and the, the good stuff, the deep, rich stuff of the gospel and the, and the new covenant, that instead they had to keep on being fed milk because milk, they're infants. They're little babies in Christ. But he really wanted to teach them the mature things, because the mature one is able to discern between good and evil, between what's righteous and unrighteous. That was this idea here. And so the beauty thing about maturity is that you're not, you're not changing your composition. You're not going from sinful to saint. You're growing up from who you've already been. You're going from an infant to a young adult, a young adult to a father to a mother. That's essentially this idea here. John was talking about that, right? When he talked about infants and young men and, and fathers. It's this maturing process going on. And again, you're not changing who you are. You're growing into who you are. I still remember the, the, the best way to describe this to you, and I've shared this before, was when my oldest was born. I mean, she's born, and they, you know, coming out of joy, and they immediately hand her off to me, which I'm thinking, that was brave of you, OK? Bold move, all right. Now I'm holding this newborn who's literally seconds old. And I looked down at my daughter. And I got tears in my eyes, and I'm overwhelmed. And then immediately I have a thought from Jesus. And he says to me, in my arms, I hold a complete woman. She's seconds old. But in that moment, she was 100% female. Now, as in the, the 17 years since, has she gotten any more female? Is she any more feminine? No. That has not changed one iota. But you know what she has done in the last 17 years? Is she's maturing. She's growing up. And she's becoming the woman that she's always been since birth. And that's what God's doing with you and I. I, I like how one author puts it. He says that the acorn doesn't become any oakier the moment you plant it. That in that acorn is 100% oak. And that's what happens with you and I. The moment you are born again, the moment you raise that hand, someone says, I see that hand. No, that's not it. The moment you, you pray. In that moment, you are transferred out of Adam into Christ, crucified, buried, resurrected, new creation, holy and righteous. That's who you are. But you know what? You're a little baby. So much to learn, so much to grow up in, so much to discover. And that's what God's doing. That's sanctification, where he's growing you and I up so that we can be mature in Christ. I think that's what Paul had in mind in this, this passage in Corinthians. Again, verse, verse 18 of chapter 3, but we all with unveiled face, right, no longer having to hide anything. Moses had to hide that glory because it was fading, because it was temporary. Now with unveiled face, we don't have to hide the glory of the new covenant because it's eternal. It's never fading. It will never diminish your righteousness with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God. Did, did, did you see that? Norm, when, when you look at Jesus and he looks at you, it's like looking in a mirror. Now, please understand, does that make Norm Jesus? No, that's heresy. And that's bad news if that was true, right? Norm's not Jesus, but it's a mirror. It's a reflection. Isn't that glorious? Do you see it? That what's true about Jesus is now true about Norm. And if it's true about Norm, it's true about Tim and true about Bobby Joe. It's true about Ivy. Isn't that incredible? That, that you are righteous as he is. Not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done. So behold, as in a mirror, the glory of God, we're being transformed. There's now that present tense ongoing, but look what it says, into the same image, being conformed to the image of Christ, from glory to more glorious? No, from glory to glory. 
Think about that phrase, from glory to glory. That's like me saying, I'm going to go from Kitchener to Kitchener. Nothing's changed. And that's what he's trying to get across, I think, to us, is that you're not becoming more glorious. You're not becoming more holy. You're simply growing up in it. In the same way that my children have grown up from women, from a little boy into manhood, into woman, that's who they are. They're growing up in that. And that's maturity. And that's what God's doing in us. And so, yes, that, that does begin to solve some of the past tense, present tense issues, is that you have been sanctified, you have been made holy, but present tense growing up in it now. And what that means, then, is your soul is heaven ready. Do you hear that? That if, if you were to, to die on the way home from church this morning, your soul would be heaven ready. Because if it's not... If it's not heaven ready right now, but suddenly becomes heaven ready at the moment of death, then that tells us that Jesus didn't do enough on the cross. That there was something about what you've done to add to it, and there's something about how you died that somehow made your soul perfect. That's why I don't believe it's progressive anymore. And you think, but, but you don't know what's going on in my mind. I could guess. I could guess, because it's what's going on in my mind. But remember, as we've talked about, that we have an enemy who's waging war with our mind, the flesh. And therefore, not all thoughts are your thoughts. Not all ideas are your ideas. Some are coming from Jesus. Some are coming from the flesh. But just because you had that sinful thought doesn't mean you're sinful. In fact, the, the fact that you recognize it as sinful, the fact that you recognize it as something you don't want to do is evidence of your righteousness. It's evidence of who you are. And so maturing now is beginning to discern those thoughts, beginning to recognize the lies, beginning to recognize what Jesus is saying and what the flesh is saying and learning to trust in him. And so that's God's work. He's sanctifying. He's maturing us. But do we play a part? Absolutely. We saw that, right? Work out your salvation. Be holy. So there's things that we do as well. But I think a great way to understand it is is summed up for us in Colossians 2 and verse 6. Colossians 2, 6 says, just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord. How how did you receive Christ Jesus as Lord? How were you saved? Did you do it? Did you work really, really hard to to clean up your act and and read the Bible? And and once you memorize one of the Gospels, now you were saved. Is that how it worked? No. How are you and I saved? By grace. Through faith, meaning grace, God did it, but there was an act of faith on my part to step into what God had set aside for me. Amen? Amen. So just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, by grace through faith, it says, he says, so walk in him, so live in him. Well, does that mean now it's up to me? If I've been saved by grace through faith, if I received him by grace through faith, then I'm also to walk in him by grace, through faith. God's doing it, but on my part is faith. My part is to step into what God has set aside for me. And that's my role in sanctifying. That's my role in maturing in Christ. And so what's happening now is each and every day, we're learning to trust him. We're learning to trust him when we recognize him as our Lord, that that I'm a bondservant of Christ. That it's not up to me that God serves me, and therefore I have my my wish list, and I pray to him, and now he has to serve me. No, he's Lord, and I am a bondservant of his. We're learning to trust him in a crisis. We're in that crisis. We're learning not to trust in ourselves, but we're learning to trust in the God who raises the dead. Now, it's not only in a crisis that we learn and we mature, but in a crisis we can. We're learning to trust him in reading and studying his word. That's why we're here this morning. We're learning to trust him in prayer. We're learning to trust him in singing his songs of encouragement like we did this morning. Where we're, we're just listening to these words and, and, and beginning to discern what Father's saying to us. He's the Prince of Peace. Rest in him. 
We're learning to trust him in in connecting with other believers. We're learning to trust him in being active in the body life of Christ. That's his church, being involved in one another's lives. We're learning to trust him in facing our past hurts and traumas so we can heal the bondage those lies have created in our lives. We're learning to trust him in rejecting the flesh by reckoning that we are dead to sin and alive as new creations in God, inviting the Holy Spirit to put to death the desires of the flesh. So we're learning new behaviors, and we're saying no to sin. I'm dead to sin. It doesn't control me anymore, but I'm alive to God. And through his Holy Spirit now, putting to death those desires and discovering that everything I need is found in Jesus in that moment. We're learning to trust him and discovering his love and his kindness towards us. And the more you discover his love for you, the easier it will be to love him, love yourself, and love others. Right? We love, why? Because he first loved us. Do you realize, John, that that's, that's a truth you'll never, you'll never fully grasp? You'll spend all of eternity discovering how much God loves you. That's why when people say to me, oh, I know God loves you, you know what I want to say? No, you don't. You have no idea. You, you, have, you have an inkling. You have, you, have, you have this much understanding. That's like saying you understand science. You have no clue. You have, you have this much understanding. Oh, but I have four PhDs in science. This much understanding. I've been studying God's word for all, my whole life. I have multiple degrees. I've written multiple books. This much understanding. It's an infinite love. The more you understand it, the more you accept it, the more you trust in it, it will make all the difference in your life. We're learning to trust him. We're maturing and offering grace, forgiveness, and love to others, especially those who have offended us. And we're really ultimately learning to trust him in all things. Do do you see that? That Romans 8, 28 and 29 it says that God causes all things to work together for our good. It doesn't say he causes all things, but he's going to purpose all things. He's going to work all things out for your good. Verse 29, the good being that you and I would be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, that we be more mature in our faith, that we be more mature in our trust in him. We be more mature as the life of Jesus flows through us. That's what God's doing. That's what sanctification is. And because it's his work, and he's always working, the glorious part of all this is you are today that little bit more mature than you were yesterday, and that little bit more mature than the day before. And tomorrow, you'll be that little bit more mature than you are right now. And maybe there wasn't a lot that you did about it, just a little bit, just a little prayer. A little bit of moment of trust, despite the the panic and anxiety and the fear, but that little bit of trust in him. Each and every day, he's maturing us. For I'm confident, Paul says, and I can echo these words, I'm confident of this very thing, that God who began a work in you will complete it in the day of Christ Jesus. Is that good news? What are, you, what are you hearing from me this morning? Because, again, this is such a critical idea because otherwise we get trapped in this, this rat race. We get trapped in this hamster wheel of performance and the law and so forth. So just shout out, whoever you, wherever you're at, just shout out what you've heard from me this morning. Trust. What about trust? Trust him in everything. Trust him in everything. What else? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom in what? In all things. In all things. You're not alone. Spirit's with us all the time. Oh, that's glorious. What else are you hearing from me this morning? He knows our pain. He knows our pain. Oh, he's right there. And when you're ready, when you're ready to give that pain to him, he'll heal it. Freedom, less bondage. What else are you hearing this morning? Love. You are loved. And because you are loved, you can love yourself. And when you love yourself, you will love others. Already, 
I'm already who I want. He wants me to be. I'm already his son. You're already his daughter. It's already been done. He's just watching you grow up now. And as, as a parent who's got five little babies and I've been watching them grow up, I can only imagine the glory that your father feels for you, the joy and the excitement knowing you're growing up. Does that mean you still struggle? Yeah. Do you fail from time to time? Yeah. But it hasn't changed your sonship or your daughtership. It hasn't changed your place in the family. It hasn't changed how he feels about you. And it hasn't changed his plan. He's taking it all into account. This is who we are today. Let's pray. Father, would you, would you encourage us each and every day? Encourage us in, in the knowledge that we are already loved, we're already holy. And the, the journey we're on right now isn't trying to become more holy. It's not trying to become more sanctified or become set apart or become even righteous and justified. It's not trying to earn anything. It's not even trying to become more pleasing to you. Just as you said to Jesus at the beginning, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, before he had done anything, may we know that that's what you're saying to us as well. And that right now what you are doing in an ongoing way is we're maturing, growing up from glory to glory, growing up to be who we've always been from the moment we were born again. And that's your plan. That's your predestined plan that you've been working out and will continue to work out in our lives. And we can trust you for that. In your name we pray, amen.